is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 384. Uh, thank you for your patience. We had some serious <laughs> technical issues happen, right? I don't know, like 10 minutes before the show started. We got them figured out. Be question patient, mark. Yeah, question mark. <laughs> uh, be patient with us tonight. It, it is a very special and important show that we're going to be doing. So uh, we're, we're basically, everything's stuck together with duct tape and, and hot glue. Hoping that it lasts for the duration of the show. But welcome, everyone, to episode 384. Our guest tonight is Angela Couser, the uh, star of the movie that I just posted yesterday, Behind the Run, episode two, following Angela Couser's journey uh, from breast cancer to the Cascade Crest 100. Um, if you have not seen that movie, I encourage you to go watch that right now, and you can come back to the show and then join us live. If you've got questions for Angela, myself, for Kim, or anyone, uh, we'll be able to answer those during the show. Regardless, welcome to tonight's episode of Ginger Runner Live. The show begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! What is up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 384. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Tuesdays to spend a little bit of it with us. Hi! Hi! How are you? <laughs> When you said that, it sounded wrong. I was like, oh, it's Monday. You said Tuesday. It is definitely Tuesday. No, it is It is definitely Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, but it is the first day of February. Mm. Happy Lunar New Year to you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. we have a very, go ahead. Sorry. No. We have a very special show tonight. Uh, we apologize about the delay at the beginning, as I mentioned there in the pre-show. But uh, tonight's episode is special. We have a wonderful guest tonight, Angela Couser, who's going to be joining us here in just a second. She is the star of the film that I just dropped on the YouTube channel yesterday, uh, Behind the Run, Episode 2, following Angela Couser's journey from uh, conquering breast cancer to training and racing the Cascade Crest 100 in 2021. Uh, it's a wonderful, inspiring movie. I hope you get a chance to watch it. If you are watching this and haven't seen it yet, Go watch it. Uh, it's about 18 minutes long, and it's well worth your time. It will inspire you, I promise. Uh, and then tonight's episode is going to be with Angela all about that journey. And uh, we've just been really excited about this show because Angela is incredibly inspiring, of course, but also very funny and warm. Uh, she's just one of the best people that we know. So we're excited to chat with her tonight. Uh, before we introduce Angela, of course, it's not just myself, our guest Angela, but it's also Kim. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Doing well. Good. Hi, everyone. Kim Jashima Newberry here. As always, if you're new, pop in the chat, say hi. We are live. So if you have questions for our wonderful guest, Angela, you can pop them into the chat room. We also uh, like to start every show by recognize, recognizing members of the community who go above and beyond to help us do this full time. We do live, uh, live shows every Tuesday now, Ginger Runner Live is going to be every Tuesday in uh, 2022, but we also do daily live streams called Daily Brew for the Ginger Runner crew. Um, basically, every tier of our Patreon uh, gets some pretty amazing perks, and uh, we love the community that's just organically been built there. If you would like to join the GR crew, all you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the Ginger Runner. Two individuals in particular at the top tier we like to recognize on Ginger Runner Live, Brian Sands. He himself, uh, another inspiring ultra runner and badass athlete. Uh, he's had an amazing journey through running, and we're really, really happy that he's a part of this community. Rick Bjarnason as well. Rick Bjarnason, an ultra runner out of BC, British Columbia. And uh, he owns a web design company. They redid the gingerrunner.com website a few years back, and now they maintain it. Uh, he's awesome. We love having him a part of the crew as well. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the show, uh, coming to us all the way from somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, I'm assuming her home uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, but she is a delight, and I can't wait to welcome her to Ginger Runner Live, Angela Couser. Yay! Hi. How are you? Good. Um, first and foremost, thank you for opening your life uh, to us and to this movie. Um, what has the last 24 hours been like for you? Because this is, I mean... You're a very outgoing person. You're very funny. You have lots of friends and people that love you. And uh, uh, obviously this community, huge fans of Angela Couser. But this is sort of the first time I believe that you've had, you know, like a movie made about you and and people who you don't know seeing you do these crazy things. So what has the last 24 hours been like for you since that movie dropped? Wow, it's been overwhelming in the best way. Um, 
I've gotten so many incredible messages of support and love. I I just feel so surrounded by um, by just everybody's love, and I I'm so glad that it's resonating with people. Have you had people who um, have had similar experiences or have gone through uh, any sort of cancer uh, reach out to you? And uh, I, I'm just super curious because your story is so inspiring and I can't, I mean, I, everyone has been touched by cancer to some degree, whether through themselves, loved ones, family, friends. And I, I feel like your story really resonates with us. That's sort of why we wanted to tell it have people reached out in that degree, uh, people with firsthand experience and, and has it helped at all? Yeah. Yeah. I have actually had, um, several people reach out and tell me not just their stories, but stories of people in their family and, or just other, you know, medical struggles or injury struggles. Um, and, you know, shout out to my parents because they are both right now going through their own cancer treatment. And uh, my dad is actually in hospice. So it's it's everywhere and everyone is touched by it. But um, the stories are are really touching to my heart. And I am I'm just glad that people don't have to feel alone. That's really important to me. <clears throat> One thing that, you know, we sat for an interview with you for a good chunk of time, you know, we sat down and talked about all sorts of things from your entire journey, which we'll get into uh, your running journey and your cancer journey. But one thing that you wanted to make sure you got across was like, you wanted to talk about this part of this film being important to you was you wanted to help chip away at that stigma around the discussion of cancer, mental health, physical health. Um, how is that important to you? And why is that important to you to have those types of discussions and to, and to bring those things out in the open? Well, um, just knowing from my own experience, when it, when it all first started, I, I, you know, you feel like you're the only person in the whole world who's ever had something horrible like this happen. Mm. And, you know, that's not true, but it's still what it feels like until your community starts reaching out to you and because you can't always be the strong person that reaches out to yourself, especially when you're dealing with the overwhelm of all of the, the treatments and the, you know, doctor's appointments and all that stuff. And so yeah. I had a lot of people reach out to me, um, both people I knew and complete strangers, which was amazing. And, um, it just helped to lift me up so much and get me through the really hard times knowing that there was other people who understood. So <clears throat> yeah, I, I did really want to get that across. And I think you did a great job showing that. So thank you. I mean, it, it's, it's, I'm so glad that you were open to the project because again, it's, it's one of those things that has a stigma. I've talked about my mental health journey on this channel and publicly, and that's, tough, you know, it's tough to kind of open up a little bit and, and to talk about the, the trials and tribulations that you go through on a regular basis. I can only imagine how difficult it was for you to do the same thing. But also, I, I want to show you some accolades, because it is such an important part of, of this journey for yourself and for others, I can only imagine the amount of impact this will have on others who are going through it in silence. Uh, because you showed that it's okay to talk about it, whether that's publicly in a movie or to put your you know journey mm -hmm. out there or to talk about it with friends, family, or a community around you. I do want to, uh, uh, again, remind you that we are live with Angela Kuzier, the star of the movie Behind the Run, uh, following Angela's run at Cascade Crest. If you have any questions for her, Kim's in the chat, and we'll pull those across for anybody uh, who would like to ask a question of Angela. I kind of want to get into some of the story that we didn't get to chat about in the movie because obviously in a movie you have to do a lot of editing and, and Kim and I knowing you and, and interviewing you know a lot more of your journey, but I thought this would be a great opportunity to kind of dig into the nuance and some of the things that maybe weren't touched on in the movie. So your running journey, you mentioned it at the top uh, of behind the run started with sort of a dare for you to run a mile back in the late nineties <laughs> and early two thousands. Uh, what was early running like for you? Did you have the relationship with it that you do now? Was it 
did you hate it like every <laughs> other person does? Uh, what was your early running journey like? Oh, yeah. I, much like so many other people, I hated it. <laughs> it was definitely a dare by Matt because he knew I didn't like it. And he, he at the time was, you know, running more than I was, obviously, because I wasn't running at all. <laughs> um, so he wanted me to be able to do it with him. And I was like, oh, fine, you know. <laughs> And it was pretty funny because once I did that, you know, mile and got through that and got my shoes and everything, um, then I didn't run again for probably, I don't know, months or maybe even a year. I was like, okay, that's enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know where I picked it up again along the way we got engaged. And I was like, oh, I should get in shape, you know, as you do. And so I started just like walking a lot and we got a treadmill um, and walking just sort of became like not enough. I, w I was like walking so fast, I couldn't really walk anymore. So <laughs> I started running from there and I was like, oh, okay, you know, maybe this isn't so bad when I'm not just going out and like running a mile as fast as possible. <laughs> Starting slow, much better idea. <laughs> I mean, Scout, with the hard-hitting questions here in the chat in regards to would really like to know if there was an actual tally of <laughs> shoes. Because I know you mentioned, you know, got my first pair of shoes. There were many over the years. Oh, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I mean, I can guess. But <laughs> I think I have an actual tally. But let's just say um, the past few years of gingermas, I have definitely filled the entire quota of donation shoes every year. <laughs> well, th that gives us an idea. Uh, there was also a question from Sarah in the chat. Um, in the in the film, you mentioned that uh, in order for Matt to buy you the certain pair of shoes, he had challenged you to run the mile. So everybody wants to know what was the special pair of shoes, if you remember. That's been like a, a big question <laughs> over the last 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay so if i remember correctly at this point because i <clears throat> i have had so many pairs of shoes now i think it was a very very white pair of of vias um oh wow <laughs> old remembers. school <laughs> old school yeah so i mean it was like 1995 so they're back in style now though i mean they would be <laughs> totally awesome <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am curious kind of in regards to racing, right? Because you ran your first mile, you got those shoes, uh, you obviously did more miles over the course of the next few years, but when did racing sort of enter your your um, mind as far as like a challenge that you wanted to take on? And then how did that continue to inspire you to continue running in those early uh, years before 2015? Okay, so um, I actually pretty early on did um, did a, several 5Ks. Uh, we lived in Bellingham at the time, and I worked for the grocery chain Hagen. And they had a, um, every year they did a 5K that was called the Hagen to Hagen because you ran across, you know, town from one Hagen to the other. Those are and grocery stores for those unfamiliar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, of course, being employed there, it was encouraged to participate. And I was like, okay, fine, you know, whatever, I'll do that. And um, so we did some a couple of those. And we did a 5k at you or at um, Western where I went to school. And um, still, though, I, I wasn't like super connected with them. I I still was like, okay, I'm going to die. Like my, my lungs are coming out of my chest, you know, <laughs> it was that kind of thing. And it wasn't until, uh, we actually moved back down South and he, well, South meaning Kent, um, <laughs> where I got more into it. Cause we lived right on the river and I started, I didn't have a job at first and Matt did. So, you know, he was gone all day and we were poor college students at the time. So I just started running on the trail on the river because right. I didn't have anything else to do. And I was like, Oh, this seems like a good idea. 
and then I just got like the crazy notion that oh, I want to do a half marathon, even though I had never done like a, even a 10k or anything in between that. Right. So yeah, so I signed up for my first half marathon, the Seattle half, in uh, 1998. It's pretty cool to know that you've been you know, running and long distance running for so long, like just for so many uh, years, just really passionate about the sport. I do want to start getting a little bit more recent in time just before 2015 and, and your relationship with trail running, because that was something that you and I and Kim really talked about in that interview. And we covered a little bit in, in the film, but you you certainly had sort of a, a transcendent experience transferring from road miles and discovering trail miles and especially up in Bellingham, which is obviously so beautiful up there. The the access to the trails and mountains is just incredible. So when did trail running really become the passion for you and, and getting outside every day and, and kind of becoming a regular habitual thing? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that whole story, you guys already know the story, but I'll just like do sh long story short. I, I did a whole bunch of other road races in between, um, you know, first marathon, second marathon. Um, and then I kind of dropped off a lot and, you know, that stuff. And, um, and when he was about one or two, I decided I really needed to be able to keep up with him. <laughs> he started walking at nine months old and I was just like, oh my God, like, I'm not in shape for this. So, um, so I started really, you know, focusing on getting, getting back my, my cardio just so I could like do a couple miles and stuff. And that was about 2012. So I, I did my first half marathon in many, many years, and I decided for 2013, just as a goal, like I like to do just random goals. <laughs> so I decided I was going to do 13 half marathons for 2013. Mm -hmm. And while I had run a lot of trails when I lived in Bellingham, I hadn't done quite as much, you know, after we moved back down here um, until I started discovering them that year when I got back into it. and. I, in that year of 2013, I had, you know, so many races to do on my list that I, I discovered that there were like trail races. And I was like, how did I not know this <laughs> for <laughs> people doing this for so many years? What in the world? So, um, yeah, so it was that year that I ran a, a couple of trail halves and I was like, this is amazing. Like, <laughs> sandwiches and aid stations what is this <laughs> these are my people <laughs> it's it's yeah go ahead oh i was gonna say i feel like a lot of us have the similarity of maybe starting with road running and then you're doing your half marathons or your 10ks or your marathons and you're not really aware of this whole other like awesome world that exists that is trail running yeah. and once you figure it out it's like oh why did it take I me so eat long? Sandwiches <laughs> yeah. at aid stations. It, it, I can't believe, like when we discovered ultra, just trail running, really, it was one of those, why have I not been doing this? It, it just seemed, uh, you know, from community to food at the aid stations to kind of the party atmosphere and a lot less like stress on having to perform really well and more about the fun uh, of trail running. And that honestly, that's what we love about you, Angela, is you bring that sense of fun and lightheartedness to this sport that so many people, you know, of course, take seriously and stuff. But I do want to 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 begin to talk about 2015. And you, you ran your first 50k. So that was kind of something that happened. Obviously, we, we talk about it in the movie, but it's a big year, because you run your first yeah. 50k uh, in the spring. And, and of course, by the end of the year, you get the diagnosis. How talk to us a little bit about the highs and lows of that year and how you went from uh, running that 50K, getting the news, and did it alter your like expectations of what you could do from then on out, or just, just kind of set the stage for us and, and for the years that follow. But let's talk about the 50K at the beginning of the year and the diagnosis. Yeah, um, so yeah, actually, um, I after doing all those races um, in 2013, I had started obviously looking into trail running a lot more and like trail races. And I decided that I wanted more, you know, I wanted more, I wanted more trails and more of that life. And so 
I started looking at ultras because I, again, I didn't realize that was a thing <laughs> before. Okay. And um, I was actually talking to, um, his name is Anthony, who worked down at Super Jock and Jill in Redmond. And he was like, oh, if you want to do an ultra, you should do the checking up 50K. And I was like, why? And he's like, because it's really pretty. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so me, like, not knowing anything about anything, what I was doing, I'm like, go and sign up for the checking up 50K. After I watched um, your movie about Kim, the Altering Expectations, and I was like, yes, I want to do that. I want to barf on this side. <laughs> You're like, she looks like she's having a great time. She's like, this looks great. I the, want this for myself. The number of people that <laughs> that watch that movie and want to do it themselves continues to blow our mind. Yeah. Like, let's be honest. Okay, so you you that looked fun. <laughs> that was fun, and so um, so I signed up and I trained the best I knew how, which was definitely not enough. <laughs> and um, but I did it, and. I, I really did feel like I transcended something like going up and over that mountain. Like I, I was on my way back to the finish line. And even though my, I was hurting so bad, I was like, oh my God, I've never, you know, like a, a marathon never hurt this bad. Like what in the world? But I still got to the end and I was like, oh my God, like I literally just climbed a mountain and came back, you know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm here and like, it just, I don't know, it empowered me, like it lit a fire in my soul so hard and I couldn't wait to do it again. But um, yeah, then it was eight months later, um, I got the the diagnosis and it was, <laughs> yeah, it just like blew everything out of the water. I was like, oh, what ultras, you know? <laughs> yeah, the perspective, I imagine everything sort of changes. So uh, we, we, we touch on you know, the diagnosis a bit in the movie and a bit of that journey, but uh, there's a lot to this story. So, you know, how did you discover it? How did you, the diagnosis happen? And and what was like the first thing to happen? Because that's, that's definitely a question that I have been asked in regards to the movie was, how quick were you into treatment? And how quick was it from running an ultra to the diagnosis to being in treatment to running again, like help help set that stage for us? Okay, so so yeah, so the check in it, um, was in March and, um, we had, we had, you know, kind of a busy summer and we were getting ready to actually go to, um, Europe and right. we, yeah, we were leaving on, um, Labor Day, like the day after Labor Day weekend. And, um, it, I, my mom had actually had a stroke and she was still in the hospital. So we were like, oh my gosh, you know, like she was like, no, no, you need to go. And um, we were like, are you sure? And, you know, just going through all this stuff. And um, I was just in the shower one day and was, I found this lump myself. And I was like, what is this? Like, it just, it seemed like it came out of nowhere. And I, you know, I mean, I had never noticed it before. And I had been doing like self checks, you know, and everything. But, it just seemed like it wasn't there. And then all of a sudden it was there. And so I kind of, I had a bad feeling about it, but since we were going on our trip, I was like, okay, I'll just, you know, deal with this when we get back. Um, and so when I, we got back from our trip five weeks later, we were, we all got really sick when we came home. And so then that delayed it even further. But I finally went to my regular doctor and got checked and she said, oh, you know, like you're really young and this, like the way it feels, it doesn't seem like, you know, a typical, you know, bad, you know, tumor or anything, but I'm going to send you in just to be sure. Cause I was only 39 and, you know, not even old enough yeah. to have my mammogram. So, um, so it was very quick after that, the day I went in for my mammogram, I ended up being there for like three hours because <laughs> I had the mammogram and then they sent me back out and then they pulled me back in and then they sent me back out. And I was like, Oh shit, this is <laughs> like, this is not, this is not normal. I don't think like, even though I hadn't done it before. Um, and then they brought me back to an ultrasound and just the look on the doctor's face who was checking it out. I was like, uh Oh, this is, this is bad news. Yeah. And so they, 
got me in literally the next day for a biopsy and they called me um, like one and a half days later and, you know, said, well, you have cancer and here's, you know, the, this is what the pathology is. And we've set you up with all these appointments. <laughs> and it was, it was literally that fast. It was like the next week I was wow. meeting with an oncologist, a radiation oncologist <laughs> and a surgeon and all the people. So how, how did it shake up your life? Because, you know, you probably have plans. You probably have you know, in January, I'm going to do this. In February, I'm going to do this. And, and even coming off of running your first 50K, I think a lot of us have the feeling of doing something big like that. And you feel like, oh, like I'm at the top of my game right, right. now. I'm the healthiest I've ever been. I'm doing this hu these huge things. How did that sort of mess yes. with timelines and, and expectations of what you could do? Well, it was, oh my gosh, it was, it was, you know, pretty much in every way, like every part of your life is suddenly affected by this. And, um, Sam's birthday, we, we had, um, postponed his birthday party since we'd all been sick. And so we had his birthday party the day before I got the call with the diagnosis. He had just turned eight and, um, and I was supposed to run the, I think I said this in the movie, but like I was supposed to run the Seattle marathon, um, <clears throat> like a week later. And I was just like, oh my God, how can I do that with all this stuff going on? And, um, you know, and then it was like, we have a yearly Christmas party when there's not a pandemic and, <laughs> it, it, you know, kind of a big deal. Like we would, there would, we had a lot of people come over and I, we, I like to feed people. So I would cook for everybody and, um, it just sent all of that into disarray. And, um, you know, it's like all the things that mattered before suddenly didn't matter. And mm -hmm. you just had to focus on dealing with all of this. So I know a bit of your story. So I'm kind of preloading this question, but in regards to finding a moment or finding a routine in all of it, because this is all like, you all, every human has a routine in their life, right? Whether it's going to work in the morning, waking up, you know, doing this, taking, taking care, care of your, your family, kid. your kid, yeah. and and coming home and and having a having a meal, going to bed, waking up the next morning and doing it again. When everything is sort of turned upside down in a matter of minutes, uh, if not hours, when did you find a routine again? Were you able to find a routine again? Because the next fourteen months obviously laid out in a completely different track for you as far as pathways. So when were you able to find a routine again? And how did that look? Um, I'm curious about that. Yeah, so that was really hard, especially in the beginning, because there, there were just so many different appointments, you know, to deal with. It was like, I literally had an appointment almost every day, I think, for the first two weeks. And so, you know, like trying to do anything normal was just not happening. <laughs> and Sam being so little at the time, I had to, you know, get people to babysit him. And, you know, Matt was like trying to still go to work, but he was also coming with me to all the appointments so that, you know, I had an extra set of eyes and ears to know what was happening. Um, and so once we got through that first about, you know, three weeks to a month, it it did get a little bit easier as far as a schedule went because I knew when the chemo was going to be, you know, it was every three weeks on a Monday. And so I, if I could set up someone to watch Sam and then go to the chemo and be there all day, and then I could, you know, I kind of knew like after a few weeks, like how bad I was going to feel for like which days. And then when I would start feeling a little bit better and, um, so I would try to just keep with, you know, like we, we homeschool Sam. And so we read together and we would, do, you know, do our school thing together, still just trying to keep that about the same. And, and then, you know, just for me to be able to get outside and get on the trails as much as possible, no matter how fast or slow I was going, that was too. <clears throat> uh, uh, 
quick shout out to Eric Paramount. We appreciate the super chat, Eric. That's very kind of you. Uh, thanks, GRL and Kim, for highlighting these kinds of stories. No question, really, just in awe of the range of folks who run for all sorts of reasons. You go, Angela. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, we do have some questions as well. I did just want to touch on the fact that you just mentioned that you do uh, or were you do homeschool Sam, your son, and something that didn't make the movie, but something right. that you said during the interview that just like hit my heart so hard. And I don't know if you remember saying this, but you mentioned it when we were interviewing you being so grateful that you were at, you were homeschooling Sam in the moment. And I'm going to cry just thinking about it, but that you you were grateful to have that time with him like all that extra time it was very yeah. very special and he's such a he's such a cool kid whoa 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 <laughs> now he, he, he's a great kid and he he's does make fine. an appearance he's a couple fine. appearances in the movie um john ives in the chat asks angela did you tell relatives and close ones soon after the diagnosis and what about your son did you tell him as well right away yeah um i did i matt was still at work and i called him first and, um, and that was hard, but the harder one was calling my mom. I called her right after that was, I mean, that was almost worse than telling Sam because at, at eight, you know, I mean, he, he knew, he knew enough, you know, but he, I don't, he could obviously like fathom or understand all of it. And, um, so yeah, so, so I told I did tell him soon after too in an age appropriate way, and and he was he was good. He was <laughs> he was also very very supportive through all of all of that too. Even as a little kid, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, he's just he's a good kid. <laughs> all the pictures that you sent me to include in the movie, uh, any one that had Sam in it was, in <laughs> it was incredibly adorable. Like you could tell that he was in it with you whether you had to take him to a chemo treatment or or to like the the hair salon right the hair salon yeah. and uh he's a good kid and obviously you're a great mom um i don't want to brush over the fact that you did mention that you ran the seattle marathon the day after your diagnosis and i uh i do want to dig deeper just into how that race went with the knowledge the newfound knowledge that you had when you ran that race was it how did it change how you raced or like what you were thinking about during a race? Cause so often people are like, I just want to get to mile 20 and get past that and then grind out the last six or whatever. Or like some people will run a marathon and feel like, Oh, this is the hardest thing I'm ever going to go, I'm through. Gonna go through. You yeah. had gotten some of the worst news, right? 24 hours in advance. How did that shape your day? Well, um, like I said, at first I was like, I can't run this race. Like this isn't going to happen. Um, but then I, I decided that I was still going to just like go pick up my stuff. Maybe I would do the half marathon or something, but I got to the, um, the, you know, the pickup and the, uh, Expo. race thing. Expo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that thing's called. Um, and I got there and I was just like, no, no, you, you know what? I'm doing this. And I'm, I mean, like, like I said in the movie, I, what if it's my last chance to, right. that I ever get to do this? Like, would this be something that I regretted just, you know, throwing away? So I decided that I was going to do it and I was going to have as much fun as I could and try to just like, not like try to turn off all the shit I just learned and, and just, ha you know, like have fun in every mile. And, and I did, I mean, there were times when I hurt, like I was kind of having a, you know, hip IT band thing, like after, you know, some, I had to walk a lot, but I didn't even care. Like I took so many pictures of myself and I feel like I look way too happy <laughs> for how I <laughs> in the moment I was happy because I was like, yeah. I can still do this today and i'm gonna do it so yeah i want i want i mean i i have to commend you because that's also not the the first race that you ran during treatments or during uh chemo or radiation or during your your cancer journey you you obviously you did many and many long training runs and you were still running and it's it's incredible i want to uh kind of talk about the years that followed and and how running 
how the cancer diagnosed the diagnosis impacted your running, your relationship with running, the importance of running to you, and how that drew the narrative of, you know, you got to do the hard things. And, you know, don't wait to do those hard things. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about that and your relationship with running. Yeah, um, so I, I had previous to the the diagnosis and everything i had also made this new goal after that 13 for 13 thing i did um i decided that i wanted to run uh, 40 half marathons by the time i turned 40 and so i was in the middle of completing that goal as well when i got the diagnosis and i still had um, three races left to go so um i was like, okay, well, you know what? This is this cancer thing. Like once I did the marathon and I got, I changed this. I don't know. It was like my mindset flipped. Like I had always, well, not in the beginning, but like for many years I had been loving running, you know, but it was like a new, a new love and like a deeper, I don't know, just like need to, to do this thing. And know that I could have some control over my, my own body and my, my fate. And so I was like, I'm still going to do it. I don't care what, you know, all you doctors are saying about, I'm going to feel so bad. Like, you know what, if I'm going to feel bad, I might as well be doing what I want to (laughs) do. So, um, so I did, I did that and I actually ran one extra on my 40th birthday, just for good measure. (laughs) And, and that's when I, I feel like that really did flip in my heart and mind and made me just, I, I wanted to always feel that joy and the, um, I want, I want to be able to move how I want with ease through the world in my body and, and that just, yeah, I, it just solidified it for me because the chemo and all the other drugs and everything, it was, you know, very painful and uncomfortable at times. And I was just like, well, you know what, if I can get through this and then what's, you know, what's running, what, what, what's putting one foot in front of the other, even if it hurts, like, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, we have a great a uh, question and comment from Casey in the chat room. Casey says, hi, Angela. I finished chemotherapy in September and radiation in November. Did you have any side effects from the chemotherapy? Thanks for your story. Oh, good for you, Casey. You got this. Um, <clears throat> I, I did. I had a lot, I had a lot of side effects and I felt like crap a lot of the time. Um, I, Luckily, I never actually threw up, but I felt like I was going to like almost every day. Um, And with the first round of chemo I had, it's called the Red Devil and it's pretty evil (laughs) form of chemo, which actually totally knocked me on my ass. I actually passed out the first night and I had to go get get IV fluids and um, come in several days after that. and then I had to take these shots called Graston shots that were to help your white blood cell count. And those were actually the worst because they make your bones hurt and mm-hmm. into like my hips and lower back, which, you know, <laughs> kind of made running not feel so good. <laughs> but once again, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do it because I, if I can distract myself with this other, you know, thing in my body, then you know, we'll get, I'll get past it. So yeah, I had all that. And then, um, and then the, the radiation was actually a lot easier for me than, than the whole rest of the chemo. It was just like terrible having to go every day, especially so early in the morning, because as you guys know, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> Neither are we. Yeah. yeah. Not, not so much in the mornings. Um, I, I do want to get to, the the surgery obviously i know that there's more details involved with the surgery but when you finally got that call that they had margins like they they got everything out was it relief was it like what is that feeling like 
And how soon after that call are you thinking ahead and planning? Because I know that you've mentioned in the movie and as part of the interview that you weren't able to think ahead. And that was one of the hardest parts was not being able to plan um, because you don't know. So with that call, how quickly did you, Angela, like, I know what I'm doing for the next, you know, six months <laughs> or six years or what was it like to have that freedom? That was, um, that was a really good day. <laughs> I, I actually, I, I actually ended up having to have two surgeries, um, because the first one was, it was really close margins. And my surgeon was like, I just want to go back in and, you know, just get a little more and make sure. And, and so I was like, okay, you know, at that point I was like, Can we just get this done with. So when I did get the call, um, like two days later, I think we, um, Matt stopped by the store on the way home, bought the expensive champagne. <laughs> <We had to> go. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, like my very first goal was just to get them to okay me to run again. <laughs> oh yeah. So I was like, every time I talked to them or went in, I was like, okay, can I do it now? Can I do it now? <laughs> I, I made it 22 days without running, which is the longest stretch I've I've gone since 2012, I think. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then I was back out there. I took Sam to parkour one day, and the the river trail is out there. And oh my god, it was probably I mean like the best, most awful, awesome run in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can only imagine just the the happiness to get outside and know that like, and again, I'm going to quote you on it, but this is like, uh, well, I already forget the quote, but it's basically <laughs> looking at this as the, the, the first day of, of, uh, not the rest of your life, but this is like a new beginning. Um, yeah. I, I forget the phraseology that you had. I've watched the movie like 8,000 times and I forget the exact terminology <laughs> used in the movie. Uh, but I do also want to get to, uh, some live questions. Can you pull the bunch aside here? What do we got? Yeah, a question from Meredith. Meredith asks, Angela, were your doctors supportive of your running during your treatments or were they concerned you would overexert yourself? Um, well, there may have been a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah. Um, my my like regular medical oncologist, she was she was a little bit like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, but my, um, my numbers were always pretty good. Like my blood, um, counts and everything. So they were like, well, you know, just be careful and like, try not to fall down. But, um, the, the actual oncology pharmacist, he was, he's a runner too. Um, and his name was Paul, which is my dad's name. And so we had so many good conversations on his lunch breaks <laughs> about <laughs> running and he was very supportive, which I can, you know, I can never thank him enough for that. But yeah, most of them were, they were very just shocked that I was still doing it. <laughs> so. You know, what's kind of neat, and I'm just realizing this now, is that you may very well, Angela, have have impacted their impression of what patients can do. Yeah. So there might be uh, people who've gone in there with breast cancer or, or other cancers and had to go through treatments who may be runners as well. And maybe those doctors are looking at those those questions differently. Like, can I go for a run? And maybe they're going to answer, sure, as opposed to, I don't know. Perhaps you changed the yeah. future for other patients, which is like, that's kind of an amazing thing to think about because you really, you ran through all of this. You ran pretty much the whole time. Like you said, 22 days was the longest that you went without. And that was purely because of surgery. Like your body <laughs> physically just could not run without probably further damaging the, yeah. the work. Um, I do want to talk, uh, I do want to get into Cascade Crest because the, the film covers uh, your race um, pieces of it, uh, at, at various aid stations purely because the race was altered. The course was altered this year or in 2021. Um, it, it was different. Uh, you really kind of had to be self-sufficient in a lot of ways for the first nearly 40 miles. And, uh, I'm just curious with your training over the last three, four years, since your, um, uh, uh, beating of cancer, how did that race ultimately go for you? Did you feel like you had the training under your belt, the experience under your belt, the excitement and and the passion to get through it? Um, 
what was it like, especially in those early miles where you're alone, you know, you're out there without crew uh, access and stuff like that for the first 40 or so miles? Well, um, I know I'm probably, I'm going to sound like a psycho, but. <laughs> <laughs> that should have made the movie. That well, I, Let's record this. I'm going to re-edit it. I might sound like a psycho. Dub and, it over something And it turns else. into a horror movie. Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> oh, but, um, man, I truly, like, I loved every minute of it. <laughs> and I, I didn't feel like I was alone. I mean, I, I don't know, like there, there were so many amazing people out there and, um, I made some amazing friends along the way. Um, specifically Amy and Lindsay, who we <laughs> ran miles upon miles together of this race. And, um, they were an awesome support to me out there, even though we had just met each other, <laughs> we're now BFFs, but, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was, I don't know everything about it. Like the day, I felt like the day was just so perfect. The weather was perfect. The volunteers were amazing. Um, it, everything was so beautiful. I had never been on many of the parts of the trails there, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I did feel, I felt ready. I, I felt like I had really built myself up a good base and done a lot of um, specific training. A couple friends and I, like we went out on the course a few times and, you know, did different parts of it. And that gave me a lot of confidence boost, especially doing the ropes course. Yeah. Um, yeah. But those, those first 40 miles were just awesome. And then when I saw everybody, um, that first time at the first aid station at mile 38, that was amazing. Um, and I do have to say too, the night before the race, uh, when Meg, Meg Chapel, my, my awesome crew captain, she, um, she asked me, you know, straight up, like, what is going to make you stop? You know, like, what do you, what do you need me to know that if you, you really need to stop, what's it going to be? And I said, uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, okay, lady, that might not be realistic. <laughs> uh, but I was just like, I was just ready. I was like, okay, fine. If I'm broken or like bleeding <laughs> on the side of the trail, then, then I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> uh, Angela, you have a, a, a leg that's uh, with a bone sticking out. Yeah. I don't care. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to finish. Just give me a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's all I need is just some caffeine. Some lukewarm pizza. <laughs> Big fan of, and a payday bar. And a payday bar. And a payday bar. Um, I think that was like a great like way to go into a race, you know? And I think yeah. also the other thing that made last year's race and races in general right now that are happening unique is that we've all obviously are living during this pandemic and for us even just being at cascade crest help film it felt like this big reunion and there was so much good energy and people just genuinely seemed happy just to be there as a community yeah um, it's a feeling that we haven't felt or seen in obviously years with yeah. everything and it was this it was a really neat energy at the start line and at every aid station and i mean especially at the finish of course and i do want to sort of chat a bit about uh those last you know, 30 miles, because there's very little access for crew or anything like that um, in those last 30 miles, as we all well know, with Cascade Crest 100. It's a beautiful course. The entire course is beautiful. The last 30, especially if so. You were about uh, 90 minutes a buffer between you and race cutoffs throughout the day. Like that's that's a solid, solid time. Um, that's not skirting close by any means. That's like a solid, wow, Angela's moving really good. In the last 30 miles of the race, of course, things started to get much, much closer um, as we were waiting towards mile 98, which is uh, Silver Creek Campground. Um, the cutoffs were getting... 96. 96. Oh, yes. No, it is 98. I guess yeah. it's technically 98. Yeah, they've changed the course <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so I'm curious, what was going through your head? How deep did you have to dig? Because those last, you know, the last descent from French Cabin from the high point of Cascade Crest Course is very steep. It's technical. It's dusty. It's hot. Um, and for those people who aren't familiar with the race, who haven't been to the race, a lot of people come down that hill 
uh, like not gracefully running down that hill. It's a <laughs> difficult hill to run. People are usually healthy. very beat up at that point. A lot of, a lot of carnage yeah. is seen up on the, on the Thorpe Mountains. So what happened in those last few miles and how did you dig yourself out um, going into the final four? So I'm curious. So, yeah, um, I was feeling pretty good. Like, I mean, I, I felt actually really good, like almost the whole time. Um, and I, I think it just really fell off my time more than anything on the trail from hell, <laughs> which is <Yeah>. aptly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't get into it, but <laughs> we see a little bit of it in the movie. It's technical. It's very technical. Yeah, it's just, it was like, you know, dark when I started and it was just like, a, you know, every, it's just like every little obstacle, you know, and you're just like, oh, it's another thing, you know, <laughs> so, uh, because I, ne I did never, I never like stopped, you know, I never like took a nap or, you know, did anything like that, um, but that really slowed me down. And then, um, and then when we got to the next aid station, I was like, oh, I, I don't. I think I had my times off or something in my head, and I, you know, I should have written this stuff down, but I was like, I was just like, oh, it'll be fine. So, so I was just like, okay, we gotta hoof it out of here, and um, and going up to No Name Ridge, that was also a really tough spot for me, mm -hmm. um, because it just seemed like it was this never-ending fire road, and you know, like the the sun was starting to come out and it's just like uphill and uphill and uphill and I'm just like oh my god it's so hot and like I, um my pacer Shauna she really kicked my ass into gear there <laughs> I cannot thank her for getting me up there enough um and so I still had a buffer when I got up there I I thought I was like gonna miss that cutoff I was trying to prepare my heart and soul for like being cut you know from the race um but I got up there and they're like, what are you talking about? You have like 40 minutes. And I was like, what? <laughs> I have 40 minutes. <laughs> okay. You know, so like, here, have some bacon, get going. You know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, um, so I took off from there and, um, and then, yeah, it's just the needles are just like the needles <laughs> and, yeah. I, you know, same there. I was like, okay, it's just one foot in front of the other, but it's just really slow going at that point. Once you come down from the mountain and you have that high of literal and figurative <laughs> being on the mountain. Um, and then you're like, okay, I know I have these needles left to go because that part, I had done some of that part of the race before. So I knew what was coming yeah. and it just like, you know, it's just your body, I think, breaking down after so long because I felt like I was going much faster than I was actually going. <laughs> I, I would look at my watch and be like, how am I going this slow? Like, I really feel like <laughs> <I'm going faster." laughs> uh, But yeah, and then coming down, you're right. Like those hills, you're like, yes, it's it's all downhill from here. But then you're like, Oh, but it's like all this crazy shale rock and you're trying not to fall and your legs are all wobbly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, coming into that last aid station at Silver Creek, I was just like, oh, my God, I, I am I'm going to get cut at the la like the last aid station. <laughs> I can't believe this. Uh, but if they like even didn't look at me, I was just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a little bit of insider baseball, but they did acknowledge like Angela came in. You could get from this aid station to the finish line um, within the amount of time then you would get the finish. And I think Cascade Crest was a little bit different this year because they did have wave start. So they're going to be yep. at the finish line anyway. Anyways. Yeah. And you came into the last aid station again, mile 98. You had four, four miles and you had 43 minutes until the race cut off. And your crew, a testament to your crew and, and to you, you were just like, I'm not even stopping. Like, there is no stopping. I'm running through. And you, you got your number checked. The, they marked you off as having come through the aid station. But what were those last four miles like? Because having all the visual of it on my end, watching it and editing it, I see it in your eyes that there's not like it's you are in a pocket of Angela and like the world is here. 
I'm curious what that's like from your perspective, having gone through all of that. What was that experience like those last 43 minutes? Man, I I have relived those four miles so many times. <laughs> and then now, you know, seeing it again, ah, it makes me emotional. Um, <clears throat> seeing it again in the film from your perspective, you know, and from what everyone else was seeing. Um, I came through there and I was still like, okay, I'm going to do this. But I did feel like in the back of my mind, I was like, oh no, I only have 43 minutes. There's no way, like, there's literally no way I can finish this in 43 minutes. You know, <laughs> like I've already run almost a hundred miles and it's so hot. And I'm just like, I don't think, I don't think I can do this. And even though like the whole race before I was like, I was like, well, I, you know, like I went through freaking cancer, like nothing's as hard as that. Like this is just running. Like I, I got this. But at that point I was just like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but when I saw all, you know, my crew there and extra crew that just people that I love that just showed up and, um, and I went through there, I was like, okay, well, I'm at least going to try because I'm, I, I have to get to the end no matter what anyway. <laughs> so, um, so I just, you know, I started running and uh, shout out to Nicole Nipper and Cynthia. And I mean, obviously my family, but like they really just got in my head in the best way, you know, like it was I I heard their words, them saying, you've got this, you're going to do it, you are, you know, you're stronger than you think, your legs still have fire, and, you know, and I just, like, focused, like, I focused, and I, honestly, I look at it now, and I'm like, I don't know how I did that, <laughs> you know, like, uh, but, um, yeah, it just, <laughs> it's just, like, I, I still, I mean, up until the last 30 seconds when we came around the, the railroad tracks and and Matt said 30 seconds and I was like oh my god like I, I'm probably gonna fall like I'm just gonna miss it <laughs> you just like there's the finish line I'm just gonna go this yeah. <laughs> where's she going well I I'm I'm happy uh to announce uh i think you've everyone's already seen uh, the end of the movie if you haven't please go watch that before uh, my next sentence um angela did finish she finished with 28 seconds to spare um so matt lied when he said you had 30 seconds left uh you had maybe 40 but 28 seconds to spare before the before uh the final 34 hour cutoff of the race um is in incredible those last four miles which you were able to do because uh they don't have splits from this year. And I'm really curious to look at the splits to see how yours compares. Um, it's probably one of the fastest splits, those last yeah. four miles of anyone in the race yes. from front to back of the pack. Like it was one of those where we were running and we were driving along and just going, I can't even keep up with Angela. Yeah, I was driving. And I was like, I can't even keep up with her. The car won't go with this fast. And I was like, I should start the car. <laughs> um, it was an incredible thing to witness incredible thing to capture and we do have nicole and cynthia in the chat in the chat here as well and angela you are an incredible athlete and to have been able to see this in person was just i mean life-changing um another really cool sort of thing that we sort of see a glimpse of in the movie but it's more inside baseball was the fact that um you were on a call with other members of this community who were watching your finish and they were cheering you on as well from across the globe like multiple people from all over the world in this community were on a call watching it play out in real time it was a really neat thing and i kind of want to wrap up this main show angela by asking you from your journey's amazing and it's going to inspire many people, whether that's just to lace up some shoes and get outside, uh, to go enjoy the woods, to go enjoy some trails, to go enjoy community or friends and, and, and to really, you know, dive deep into nature. But it might also help people through some really difficult times, um, people who might be going through very similar experiences to what you went through, uh, or maybe they will, maybe they have fan, friends or family, as we mentioned, that will go through it as well. What did it teach you? What did you take from your experience battling and conquering breast cancer and approaching something difficult and hard like Cascade Crest? What are the lessons that you're pulling out of this that we can all soak up? Because 
that's really where I kind of want to wrap up this main show is just is just knowing what we can take from this because it's it's beyond inspiring. Well, I think um, <clears throat> three of the biggest things I think are, um, you know, your people and your community are more important than you think they are. Um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you need them, they want to be there for you. So please don't ever be afraid to ask for help and, and accept help when it's given to you. Um, that and, you know, don't wait to do the things that you want to do and do, you know, go to places that you love and tell people that you love them and and don't worry about sounding like a dork because <laughs> it, it doesn't matter you know people need to know that you love them and they'll appreciate it just as much as you do and um and also you know the last thing is just like you it, truly like i truly have learned that you always have so much more inside of you than you think is there. And I feel like it's a lesson I keep learning over and over in life. But this, this last couple of years, it's really hit home for me. And so I hope that, I hope that people can know that without having to go through such hard times. <laughs> Thank you, Angela, for the time tonight to sit and, and to chat a little bit about your journey, but also to open up again so much of your life, uh, your family's life, of course, um, and everything that you went through in this movie. Uh, it was an honor. Um, just so people know, I reached out to Angela not long before Cascade Crest and with the question, I would love to follow your journey and tell your story. And Angela, without hesitation, was like, absolutely come follow me at Cascade Crest, do this and do that. And I was like, I don't want to add pressure. <laughs> and Angela just without missing a beat was like, I don't feel pressure. And I remember that. I remember you putting me at ease because I was worried about telling the story and if I would do it justice because it is so powerful and it's affected our lives personally, like, you know, our inspiration, we draw so much from you but that you were, you put me at ease. Um, it's usually my job to help put the subject <laughs> of whatever I'm documenting at ease. And that, that was, it was in that moment that I was like, this needs to be told because this person is beyond anyone that we've met and she's incredible. Angela, you're incredible. And we really, really appreciate you opening up so much. And I hope, I hope anyone who's watching this show or the movie that needs it, finds that inspiration, finds that hope, because Angela right up there in the corner is proof that we can find more within ourselves than I think we think we're capable of. Angela Kuzier, we really appreciate you so much. Thank you. We are going to wrap up our show, but we have many people in the chat room that are furious that we have not done the quick question <laughs> quiz yet. Don't worry, friends. It's always been the plan to end the show with what we like to don or like to call the quickie question quiz, which we don upon our first time guests on the show. Just really quick before yeah. you do the quickie que question quiz, uh, we have Billy in the chat room and Billy was pacing uh, his friend and you passed them coming into Easton. Uh, oh, I and, bet Billy is uh, in the flick. That's what I was thinking too. Um, and you, Billy, and your your friend were also doing an incredible job. They were moving. Yes. Yeah, because they yeah. were in the exact same position. I think they arrived at Silver Creek just before Angela did. And Silver Creek was like, yes, get to the finish. Uh, you can get your finish. And it was like back and forth between Angela and I don't know the number, the runner's name. Yeah, I'm Billy not sure what right. uh, Billy's yeah. runner's name is, but I did want to I did want to mention that because I thought it was very uh Shout out to, to Billy. That's, that. that's awesome. They're in the chat room as yeah. well. And they, they also finished. So their runner also finished and got a finish as well, which is really, really neat. Uh, okay, so quickie question quiz. This is basically a rapid fire series of questions that we ask all first time guests on the show. Angela, when you're ready, give me the thumbs up and we'll dive right in. It's very easy. All right. <laughs> it's only easy if you studied. I hope you studied. <laughs> these aren't the typical, these we'll are very, see. these are very difficult. I literally just told you, Angela, every answer that you're going to have here. I sure hope you watch Taskmaster before this. <laughs> okay, here we go. What was your very first race? Oh, 
Uh, my very first Reese was the, it was, um, Oh my God! It was the the Western uh, Western Washington five K Western Washington University five K. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite place to run currently? Tiger Mountain <laughs> has my heart. <laughs> I think I know the answer to this one. Road or trails? Uh, trails all the way. <laughs> Bucket list race. Oh my God! I oh shoot. I feel like Cascade Crest was it. And now, um, now I just want to get back in again. I'm 16 on the wait list. So. You've moved up. I did. <laughs> but, um, oh, if I had to pick a different one, I would I would definitely love to do Western States one of these days. So, uh, Favorite running movie, and you are allowed to say your own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... Um, I mean, it's your parents' favorite running movie. <laughs> I am going to say my own because you did such an amazing job and it's so beautiful. And I just want to thank you for telling my story so well. Uh, Everyone's crying now. I'm trying. I don't Everyone's want to acknowledge crying. that answer because <laughs> I will cry. Guilty pleasure TV show. Uh, currently, we are watching a uh, South Korean show called Singles Inferno on Netflix. <laughs> I have heard of this. All right. Well, we got to add it to the list. Um, what is, What is your pre-race meal? What do you eat before a big race? Uh, I'm kind of stuck on perfect bars. I I don't know if you've ever had them, but they are. Sound they perfect. sound perfect. Yeah. They are. They're perfect. They're <laughs> non but like, <laughs> yeah, not non sponsored. Uh, favorite like, post race, all kinds of good stuff. So, uh, favorite post race meal, coffee. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, usually, uh, I crave like a nice big burger after a, after a hard effort. And finally, what are your current running shoes? What are you running all your trail miles in? Uh, my current running shoes, my fave, are um, the Olympus for uh, the Ultra, Ultra Olympus for. Sometimes I run in Lone Peaks, but the the Olympus is definitely my favorite. Angela Couser, you just passed the Quickie Question Quiz. Congratulations! <laughs> well done. Uh, it was a little like touch and go there at the beginning. I did not know <laughs> if like you'd get through it. Rough start. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking like, oh man, this is gonna be like a C plus, <laughs> maybe a D. Uh, but congratulations. <laughs> Um, our guest tonight, Angela Couser, truly inspiring individual. We're so thankful to have her on the show and to have this uh, uh, the, the privilege of documenting her journey at Cascade Crest. Uh, we are going to move into our after show. So GR crew members, get ready. We have a lot of questions still here from the live show. We'll ask any additional questions in the after show as well. If you would like to join our after show, it's very easy to do. Go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. Angela, uh, any last thoughts or things you would like to shout out or places where people can follow you on social in case they want to continue following your journey? Where can they go? Uh, the best place to follow me is on Instagram, and uh, that's at DA Run Geek. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to say thank you to everybody who's watched and reached out. And I love you, GR Crew. You're the best fam. Our guest tonight, Angela Couser, we are just in awe. Um, our last segment of the night, of course, is to recognize members of the community who go above and beyond. We call it our GR Crew Member of the Week. Mm -hmm. Angela, of course, is a GR Crew Member and one of our <laughs> GR Crew Members of the Week. And it's a week. And it is a week. <laughs> so Kim, who is this week's GR Crew Member of the Week? Uh, so this week's GR Crew Member of the Week, so I did I did kind of backtrack a little bit because we did take a few weeks off uh, during the Christmas the break. Mm -hmm. So I did kind of dig around a little bit. So this this week's GR Crew Member of the Week is actually from December, and it goes to Melissa V. And Melissa in November uh, ran the Run the Rock in Oregon for her very first official 50-miler. Sweet. And then five weeks later, uh, she did the Banshee Solstice Run at Cougar Mountain locally and pulled off 52 to 55k in seven hours and 15 minutes well done i want to say congratulations to melissa congratulations melissa v on being our gr crew member of the week love it uh we're gonna move right into our after show again patreon.com slash the ginger runner helps support everything that we do on this channel including the documentary we just made 
So uh, any support, any tier, it all helps. It all goes to cool projects like that. We're very, very thankful. Am I forgetting anything? Just really quick before we close the main show, I, I also want to extend our thanks to the rest of your family, Angela, yes. to Matt, and to Sam for allowing us to and Hattie, and Hattie uh, shove cameras in everyone's faces and 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 get in your space yeah. all day and all I don't night. know if Matt is still there, <laughs> Angela, but um, please give him a big hug and a thank you as well. Uh, Sam gets a high five, but like, I know that he doesn't probably like to hug. Sam, I will find a custom joke to tell Sam. That will be I, great. I, I and we'll cover that in the joke. after show. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you in the after show, or we'll see you next week for more fun. Get out there, train hard, race harder, and part of the hardest. I know I am. Thanks, all. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye. Danger.